may be seated. We offer the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips, giving praise to God, right? Sometimes it feels like a sacrifice. Sometimes it's a joyful sacrifice, and hopefully it is tonight. God has been good to me, and I know that he has been to you as well. Amen. 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 We're going to look at Romans. We're going to begin in Romans chapter 14 tonight, and we're going to talk about the last three chapters of the book of Romans before we move on to some new topics during Bible study. The po- the, in, in the beginning of chapter 14, this passage gives direction on handling differences of opinion while maintaining unity. If you've lived any time at all, then you know that people are going to disagree about things. But you know how people say, my husband always says, you can disagree without being disagreeable. That's a pretty common saying. You can disagree without being um, disagreeable. And so we're going to talk about when it's okay to disagree without being disagreeable tonight. These guidelines only talk about non-moral issues that do not violate biblical commands or principles. Okay? So there are some things that we're not going to disagree on. Where If we disagree on them, we're not going to be in unity. There are some things in the Bible that are explicitly spelled out in the Word of God, and that's the way it is. And we're not going to say, okay, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe, and we'll all get to the same place. We're going to believe what's in the book. But then there are certain things that people have opinions about. And those are the non-moral issues. And we're going to look in Romans chapter 14. We'll start in verse 1. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes that he may eat all things, another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eats despise him that eats not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eats. For God has received him. So what are they talking about? They're not talking about the plan of salvation or anything like that. They're talking about some people think you should eat meat. Some people think that you shouldn't eat meat. And if you have an opinion like that that is not explicitly stated in the word of God, then there's no reason to fight about it. If you want to be a vegetarian, God bless you. If you want to eat meat, God bless you. And there's nothing scripturally on either one that we should argue about. Okay? I can't say you're not my brother or sister because you choose to be a vegetarian and I eat meat. Or vice versa. Okay? So it says, um, so we can't judge another. If we go to verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Who is our master? Okay, so I I can't judge the way your relationship is with God when it comes to the non-moral issues such as eating meat. Okay? And then that's the the first example that it uses. And then it goes on and it talks about Verse 5, it says, one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day, regards it to the Lord. He that regards not the day to the Lord, he does not regard it. I'm in verse 6. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eats not, to the Lord he eats not, and giveth God thanks. So here's the other issue. And, and if, you, if you've been around Christianity very much at all, you've probably met people that had disagreements about some of these topics. And so you, well, maybe the Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, you have to worship on Saturday. Or, oh, you have to worship on Sunday. And it gets into talking about that in this part because it doesn't, there's nothing explicit in the scripture. Right. In the Old Testament, under the law, they were commanded to keep the Sabbath. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. Right, yeah. the, um, from everything we know about church history and the word of God, the disciples worshiped on the first day of the week. And some say that's in honor of Christ's resurrection. He rose on the first day, and so that's when they worshiped. 
if you if if certain people have a belief that there is they must keep the sabbath then they must keep the sabbath then that's between them and god yeah. okay and so that's what we're talking about when we talk about um christian liberty we have to avoid controversy and fighting over things that are just personal opinions it says don't somebody's weak in the faith and that is in verse two i think he talked about another who is weak faith in this case means christian knowledge persuasion or conviction it doesn't mean saving faith it doesn't mean persevering faith it just means where they are in their christian knowledge um at this time when he's writing to romans um, some of them even maybe chose not to eat meat because it could have been offered to idols. Some may have been because, well, if, I, if there's a Jew, they don't know how it was prepared, if it was prepared according to the law, if it was in a kosher kitchen or, or anything like that, if it was prepared according to the law. So there are three principles to guide our behavior in non-moral matters. Okay? Non-moral matters. First of all, each person should develop their own personal convictions. And if your heart convicts you, God is greater than your heart. If you feel convicted about something, that's your personal conviction. There may not be a scripture that says thou shalt not. Years and years ago, when I was a child, there was an old time preacher's wife. She did not, she's gone on, she did not believe in wearing the color red. Okay, you guys know that I wear red. I'm not picking on Brother Dave tonight. I, I wear the color red. I have two or three things that are red. For her, it was a personal conviction that she not wear the color red. I don't know, she thought it was too flashy. She thought it represented something immoral from the, the, the historical time period, whatever it was. That was her personal conviction. I wouldn't argue with her over that because that was, but wouldn't have anyway because that would have been totally wrong. But, um, but just to say that was her personal conviction. That was between her and God. Okay? And so there are things that are personal convictions that you may have that I don't have and vice versa. I may have some personal convictions that I don't necessarily preach over the pulpit because they're not necessarily something that I can back up, but they're something that I believe for me and God has convicted me of, and so I don't do them, right? So we all have to develop personal convictions and follow our, and the second thing is we have to follow our own conscience, okay? So if your conscience, like I said, if your conscience convicts you, God's greater than your heart, listen to it. And if you're feeling something, and you feel like I shouldn't do that, pray about it, search the scriptures, seek counsel if you feel that you need to. But if God is speaking to you about it, I know there was a time a lot of elder ministers would not go into a restaurant where there was a bar. So there have been times in my husband and I's ministry where w w the, the pastor or or us, we were going to take them to Applebee's or someplace like that. And they said, could we please go someplace different because there's a bar in there. That was a personal conviction. Okay. And if they ask that, then we honor that because we don't want to be a stumbling block to someone else. Okay. And then in everything we do, we need to acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord. He's God. Okay. All right. So we don't want to tempt others. Oh, I will say Colossians 3 and 17. Ask yourself when you do something, can I do this unto the Lord, giving him thanks, glorifying him, and acknowledging his lordship while I'm doing it? If you're in a situation and you feel like you can't glorify God in what you're doing, it's probably time to remove yourself from that situation, whatever the situation is, okay? Okay. But let's look at Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word or do, deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Everything you do in word or in deed. Okay? So when we drop down to 14 verse 13, it says, 
Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. We're not going to judge each other on those personal convictions. But we also don't want to do something that's going to put a stumbling block in somebody else's way. If it's, if it's going to cause them to fall, if it's going to cause them to question God, then we don't do it while we're around them or when we're there. We need to be, because we need to be respectful. There needs to be the, the last time um, in our Bible study, we talked about that whole exposition on love. If we're loving each other, we're not going to do something to try to harm them, right. right? And that's more than one place in the Bible. That's also over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But we, we want to show love. And so we can't do anything that is going to tempt others. And then we also want to follow the example of Christ. If we move on to um, chapter 15, I'm not going to read every single verse tonight. But it says in chapter 15, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. We have to follow the example of Christ. Now, one of the things that sometimes you might hear if you believe in a certain standard of living, and I believe in holiness, holiness and separation is not a non-moral issue. Holiness and separation is a commandment of the, of the word of God. But one of the things that you, fall, that you might hear um, criticized, be criticized of if you believe in holiness is, well, you're just too legalistic. And you can be. You can go too far to be to legalism. Legalism is a strict or excessive conformity to a list of rules. Okay? And it's trying to base salvation on performance, good works, or complying to the list. I always think of the Pharisees. Jesus said, you've made these rules way harder than I did. This is the Julie paraphrase again. You've made them way harder than I have, and you've made them so hard that you can't even follow them yourselves. And I've known people who have a list in their head, and they go into a church, and they start looking everybody up and down. She got on high heels. That's not on my list. You know, she got on gold glasses. That's not on my list. He's got on a bright, you know what I mean? And that's legalism. When you start, um, and I'm not, none of those things bother me. I'm not, I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. But people have a list, and if you've known the list and you feel that critical spirit, that's where that legalism comes from. Okay. It's like, well, we're going to have to uh, adhere to this list. And the, the, the list is not based on Scripture. Okay? Yeah. If it's based on Scripture, we're going to follow it. But avoid legalism by preaching that salvation is through faith, not works. Nobody is going to earn salvation. And holiness is a result of a new life in Christ and not how you're saved. Yeah. If you have been born again of the water and of the spirit, behold, if any man is in, in, in Christ, he is a new creature. If you are a new creature, holiness is going to become part of your life. Right. And there's nobody that's going to have to hand you a list and tell you what to do, because if you are a new creature in Christ, you're going to do things differently. Right, yeah. The caterpillar does not act like the butterfly. Oh, that's right. oh, amen. Because they're a new creature. Right, right. And so when you are transformed and the Spirit of God is living inside of you, then the Spirit of God is going to speak to you and say, um, maybe not. Right. And if, if you listen to that Spirit of God... And you say, okay, I don't know why, but this is, I'm not feeling this is right, so I'm not going to do it. You listen to that, God is going to guide you. He's, the Bible says he'll, the Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. Okay? So we want to learn that holiness is about the new life in Christ. And that we avoid legalism by recognizing that the moral law and not the ceremonial law. Okay? We don't have to abide by the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. We don't have to offer up pigeons and goats and bullocks and 
and all those things. But we do abide by the moral law, don't we? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. The moral law is still in effect, okay? So, and we also have to make sure that our biblical teachings are from the Bible and not from traditions of men. We all have traditions. And some of them are good, and some of them are not so good. But I can't put my traditions on you as a way to live because it's my tradition. If I'm going to preach something to you, it needs to be from this book and not because of the way that I was raised or because of the way that my parents were raised. Okay? So, so the biblical meaning of Christian liberty, if we're going to talk about Christian liberty, which is what we're talking about in the chapter 14 and the first about 13 verses of chapter 15, Christian liberty means we're free from sin. Christian liberty means we're free from the law. I mentioned that. We don't have to follow the law anymore, the ceremonial law. And freedom in non-moral matters. Non-moral matters like, do you want to be a vegetarian? You can be a vegetarian. If you don't want to eat pork, you don't have to eat pork. I've met lots of people who want to follow that part of the law. And maybe it's because of health reasons. If you don't want to eat bacon, God bless you. Pass the plate, you know, you know, <laughs> but, but that's, but that's a non, that's a non moral. Okay. So when we have freedom, God is glorified. When we use our freedom, it's also, it's beneficial to us and not harmful, either physically, mentally, or spiritually. So I want you to think about that. If what you're doing is harmful to you physically, Maybe you need to stop. If what you're doing is harmful to you mentally because it takes you to a place you don't need to be, don't do it. If what you're doing is harmful to you spiritually, causes you to get your mind off of God, causes you to miss church, causes you to not read your Bible, causes you not to, to pray, that isn't Christian liberty. And when we have Christian liberty, we can maintain control over it. If you are, have a smartphone, you have to maintain control over it. And if you can't maintain control over it, maybe God's talking to you about something. And I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> But I'm not <laughs> come out of the book there, okay? And whenever you're doing, it's not a stumbling block to others. God gives us personal convictions due to our own individual differences, okay? Now, there are weights and hindrances, and that's what I'm talking about sometimes when I'm talking about what's on our smartphone or our iPad or our whatever you use to stream media into your home. Some of those are weights and hindrances, in Hebrews 12 and 1, says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So some things are not sins in themselves, but they're a weight and they're a hindrance and they're not going to be beneficial to your Christian living. Okay? So we can have fellowship with other Christians and still not agree on every single issue. Okay? Okay? So then if we move into um, epilogue, the epilogue, which is the ending, and it starts in verse 14 of chapter 15. Most of the book of Romans is a discussion of doctrine. But then we get down to this part, and you know that the chapters and verses were added later. Okay? When we get down to this part, this is the more of the context of a letter. And so Paul in chapter 14, or chapter 15, verses 14 through 21, is talking about his reasons for writing. Now, we've talked about the fact that he's writing to the church in Rome where he's never been, and he's commending them for their faith. In verse 14 of chapter 15, and it says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. He's saying, you know what? You've got some good stuff going on. 
you've got some knowledge, you've got some goodness, and you can, you can um, help each other. So he's giving them, he praises them for, for their spiritual maturity. And then he goes in and he discusses his call to ministry. When it starts in, vis, um, in verse 15, he says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ, ministering the gospel of God. And so he talks about how he is a minister of the gospel. If you notice, he doesn't talk about how many people he baptized. He doesn't talk about how many churches he started. He doesn't talk about the number that are, is in his congregation. He only talks about, I am preaching this gospel, and it is my job to present a clean and godly people to the Lord as a minister. And you know what? I'd love to have a bigger church. But I don't 100% judge the success or failure of this church by the number of people that are sitting in the pews. If there are people here who are loving God, who are drawing closer to him, who are endeavoring every day to live for God, then that's what it's about. And I don't believe that when I stand before God and my husband stands before God, he says, okay, Hastings, Nebraska, how many did you baptize? How many did you run on Sunday morning and I don't mean Easter? You know, it's, it's like, it, that's not what it's going to be. Right. It's the ones that were there, did you teach them the truth? The ones that were there, did you show them the word, of, the, love, the love of God? The ones that were there, okay? So that's what Paul goes into when he talks about that. Then, if you go down to verse 22, he talks about his personal plans. And he's telling them that he's going to visit them soon, but he has to go to Jerusalem first. And there's a whole part in there where he's talking about the fact that he's taking an offering to Jerusalem. The saints in Jerusalem were poor, and they had had a collection from the Gentile churches, of which Paul had started a whole bunch of them. And they were going to take this, and he was going to take that. It was his responsibility to get that offering to Jerusalem, and he felt that that was his duty. And the fact that the Jerusalem church, even though they were poor, they had let people go out. They had been persecuted, which is how come so many people went out from them. Persecution scattered the church and spread the gospel. Yeah. If you read the book of Acts. And so he's talking about he's going to take those financial contributions to the church in Jerusalem, but he still intends to visit Rome. Then we get down into, in verse 15, or chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. And he starts out by recommendation of Phoebe, a worker in the church at Centria. I don't know how to say it. He called her sister. Um, I commend you unto, unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. And so he called her sister. Now, in Pentecost, we've had that custom. Other churches do too, not just Pentecostal churches. Many churches call each other brother and sister as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Right. And that custom could have started from the early church because there's, there's times in that when he said that. Um, so, but he also called her a servant of the Lord. The Greek word servant is diakonos which is the same word translated as deacon in Philippians 1 and 1 and in 1 Timothy 3 and 12. So he translated, so there was a, evidently this Phoebe was a deacon in the church. So from this verse and in others, we see that women occupy, occupy places of responsibility in service in the New Testament church. I'm not up here, I'm not up here to, to ride that horse, but I'm just telling you what's in the word of God, okay? Yes. I'm sorry, no, you're fine. I I can't tell you exactly from this. Um, it says that she was a ser a servant. If you go on down. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In the and in, and in the book of Acts. In like six or seven, in chapter six or seven, it talks about they appointed deacons in the church and they listed their names. Stephen, the first martyr um, that is known, um, was a deacon in the church. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was listed both of them. So then um, in verses three through 16 of Romans chapter 16, 
he lists a lot of greetings. He greets a lot of people. And 10 of them were women, Aaron, and he gave a special comment for eight out of the 10. So he called them servant, he called them helpers, he called them fellow workers, um, he called them um, no, uh, laborer in the gospel. So those are the words that he used. But this passage, when he's greeting all these people, whether they be male or female, because this is not about um, the women's lib movement, because I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of that, okay? This is not about that. But when he greeted them, and he greeted all of the people, then he was talking to them and showing that he loved them. Tell them hi. You know, when you go to someone, when my husband's gone, or when somebody's gone, you say, hey, tell him I missed him. Tell him I said hi. Because there's that love and that fellowship there, and we do that with each other. You know, there's people that aren't here tonight because they're traveling or because of events that are happening. It's spring, and there's a lot of events going on. Um, and so people aren't here tonight, and we miss them. We look around, and, you know, as a pastor, I know where everybody is. Right. I'm not upset. I'm not worried. But I do feel the emptiness and the, and the spot of, oh, I miss them tonight. They're not here, right. you know, as they're part of, the, as part of the body of Christ. And so um, in this, whenever he's greeting all these people, that kind of shows that fellowship. If you know, if you look back in Acts, and this isn't in my notes, so it's not in there at all, son. But if you um, look in the book of Acts, um, in, after Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and he told them how to be saved, down in verse 42, he said, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. Okay, And so that fellowship is part of it. Some of us love potlucks, some of us don't love potlucks, but fellowship is part of it, right? Because we need to be together. When we break bread together, there's a closeness that we can have because of that, okay? And so that is a, something to recognize that a characteristic of the early church was the fellowship and the love that they had to each other and the kindness that they had. And then if we look down in verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 17, he warned them about troublemakers, people that come and cause division. And they try to cause offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And he said, avoid them. If somebody comes in and starts trying to stir up trouble, avoid them. If somebody comes to you in any way, we don't. It says for um, verse 18 of chapter 16, if you could pull that up. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They're only in it for their own glory. They're trying to get their own. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. And so be careful. He warns. And if you want to write these scriptures down, Matt, I don't know if he has them in there or not. But this was not an uncommon refrain for Paul. He warned about troublemakers in multiple places in the Bible. Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19, he warned of troublemakers. 2 Timothy 3 and 5, he warned about troublemakers. Titus 1, 10 through 11. And then Peter did the same also, 2 Peter 2, um, 12 to 19, and Jude also, Jude, verses 11 through 16. So all of these people, Paul in multiple places, Peter and Jude, all were warning about troublemakers. We can't get away from them, can we? They're here, okay? So that was his final admonition or his final warning or correction that he gave. Then in 16, 21 through 24, he gave his companions that the people that were with him also said, hey. It's kind of like you're with him and you're, you're on FaceTime and you're like, hey, here's Here's Rachel, wave hi to Rachel, she's here too, you know. And so how you're, or you're like um, on the phone and mom says to tell you, you know, my mother-in-law, you know, she says that, um, give him a kiss for me, you know. Um, and Wilson, the last time when he couldn't go, he's like, give my mom a hug and don't tell me you're going to do it and not do it. So you have to give her two, one from you and one from me, you know. And so it's, it's that kind of thing. And that's kind of what it was. The people that were with Paul were also giving their greetings, 
and most there, Paul had a scribe that was writing his letters. And so the scribe was also saying, yeah, hey, I'm here too, you know. And so they were greeting each other. Then I wanted to read at the end, 25 through 27, Paul closes Romans with a passage of praise to God. And this is different from the way he ends a lot of his other books of the Bible. But he says, um, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, he's saying, okay, we got Jesus, and he's made manifest. It was secret, but the prophets told us about it, and now we're understanding According to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all the nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. To God be the glory. That's kind of what he's saying. Through Jesus Christ. And he's ending with a praise to God. Okay. So I thought that was, um, that was interesting to think about the fact that it was different than it was in some of the other books. When in Sunday, we talked about Habakkuk. That's been my own little personal Bible study that I've been doing on the side, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk questioned God, but he ended in praise. I talked about it Sunday a little bit. He ended in praise. And so that's the way that we need to be, too, as well, right? We're going to end in praise. Let's end in praise tonight. Let's stand. We don't have to have music to praise God, right? Because we have our voices. So let's just lift up our voices and tell the Lord thank you and that we love him and that he's been good to us. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us, God. Thank you for all the goodness that you've